Hello there, my name is Will Patillo, and today I'm going to be sharing with you a evolution simulator and walking through how to build it. Uh, first, a little bit of context here. My uh, reason for building this is I am working on a ecology simulator called Ecosim. I'm uh, playing some clips from it in the background right now. And it's getting to a point in development where I think it would be interesting to play around with evolving some of the animal traits. Uh, for example, how likely rabbits are to dart to the side when they're being chased, or how likely foxes are to dart forward at, when they're chasing something, and you know, so, so on. A lot, lots of traits where it isn't really clear exactly what the setting should be. And also, maybe that's something that changes over time and context, uh, and makes the animals a little bit more dynamic and individual. Um, however, there are a lot of unknowns working with that in the context of a complex project. So to, uh, dive, to understand that better, I've built a sample project to test some ideas out um, and check some various assumptions that I have. and. That's actually a perfect thing to share with you all. So to start out, I'll jump right into this, bring up my Unity scene here. I'll go over how the, the scene's organized first. I got a main camera, it's just a solid color background, orthographic display, so it's a nice uh, two-dimensional mode. Uh, have a population controller right here. Uh, which has some user interface controls, setting its evolution style, how much the mutations happen, how quickly it iterates, an option to start simulating, to stop, to step through one generation. And uh, then the individuals, these are just cubes you know, to be displayed. I'm going to be playing with their scale and their color, so five different dimensions uh, overall, which we'll see in a moment. And each one just has this individual component here, uh, which we'll go over. And as you can see, these are all the same. These rows have no purpose other than to just keep things a little bit organized when I was building the scene. All right, so let's dive right into the code. Start with the DNA script. This is just a data container. It does not derive from mono behavior. It's not using any libraries. Because all it does right now is store some floating point numbers. Uh, I got some constants uh, for height max and height min. So for each variable, I have a maximum and minimum that it doesn't make sense to go beyond. Um, so for example, with these cubes, if it gets bigger than two, then it starts to overlap with the cubes next to it. And that wouldn't look very good. And if it's smaller than 0.1, you can't see it. Uh, and then with these RGB values, the range is between 0 and 1, um, because when you set a color in a renderer, it has to be between 0 and 1, and you can't get more red than completely red or less red than not at all, so that, that's why those ranges are there. And then the more important part is the current value. Now, if we go next into individual, you'll see that uh, on creating this instance of individual, it creates a new DNA that belongs to this particular individual instance. Uh, so each one is going to track its own data, and also a reference to a renderer so we can change its uh, color. Then on start, just get a reference to the renderer and randomize all of the traits. So let's see what that involves. So I just go through and I set all its data points. Um, so DNA.height is set to a random range between its minimum and maximum values. Same goes for width, red, green, and blue. And then once it's done setting all of the values, I refresh the display. Let's take a look at that. This is very simple. Um, all the data has been set. Now we're just displaying that to the user. So we set the color to the stored red value, green, and blue, uh, and then we set the scale of the cube to the width and height stored in the DNA, and the Z I'm just leaving at 1 because this is a two-dimensional view, you can't see the, view value, uh, the Z value. So for now, I'll just uh, show that, what happens when you start, bam, like that. Uh, every different cube has its own color, 
width and height. So some are wide and not very tall, some are closer to cubes, reds, greens, blues, all kinds of variations in between. Um, and if I were to run this again, it would look different. Okay. Uh, so next, uh, before I get into some of these other things, let's take a look at what's going on in population. Okay, uh, so we here got have some user controls. I'll go over those in a moment. Uh, first thing is it has a reference to an array of individuals. And on start, just since the population is the parent object for all of these, I just use a get components and children to get all of them. Uh, there are generally cleaner ways to get lots of component values. I could set up like an observer pattern or something. But for a simple project like this, this one line works great, and the fact that it's not great for performance doesn't matter because this is such a lightweight project that that's it'll be fine. So uh, next on update, I just get user input, um, and getting user input, there's a couple of different conditions. So actually, I'll just show what this looks like when it's running um, to get a sense of what our goals are, and I'm going to keep the aimless evolution style, uh, which just randomizes every single step. So the first thing I can do here is I can click the step button and it changes. Actually, uh, no, I'm going to use randomize evolution style. Go over aimless next. So this each time it's like stopping and restarting the application. Uh, everything is totally randomized. It doesn't matter what was happening before. That's all. Uh, and then next I have an option to run and stop. Uh, so if I click run, then it just, it's like clicking the step over and over. Hit stop and it doesn't do that anymore. I could speed things up by changing the seconds per generation and bam. Uh, mutation amount isn't going to matter in the randomized style. Oh, and then just some other little details. If I click stop when it's already stopped, nothing happens. If I click run while it's already running, then nothing happens. And if I click step while it's running, then it stops. All right, so let's go over that user input. Uh, so first of all, if the um, step Boolean is clicked, uh, make sure that we're not running and go through one iteration. And what uh, an iteration is, is this tick value right here. For each individual in the population, evolve the individual. And evolve individual looks at the evolution style and calls a method for that individual. So right now it's randomize uh, because the evolution style is randomize. It calls individual randomize all traits, which remember here, just random value for everything. I'll go over single inherit uh, next. Okay, so that's the step. If uh, it's not running already and the player clicks run, and then we set running is true, stop is to false, and we begin this invoke repeating that looks at the seconds per generation um, and just updates it every time. Uh, and so and that invoke repeating is going to be calling this tick value repeatedly. Uh, next, player clicks the stop button, stop the invoke, and set some booleans appropriately. Next, uh, if oh someone turns off the run button and it's running, then they can't do that. Um, and likewise, here this is the same thing. If they try to untick stop without stopping the, the program, um, that just set it back. Uh, because if all the boxes, if all these boxes were unchecked, it wasn't running, it isn't stopped, and it isn't stepping, that, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, so there's just some, a little bit of uh, forcing some things on the user right there. So that's it for the population right now. Next, let's take a look at this single inherit method in the individual. So what this does is uh, <clears throat> takes in a mutation range, um, which is this mutation amount, which is set here. And it 
creates a mutation value, which is plus or minus you know, what just came in. And then it applies that mutation to the existing value. And for that, because it's this, the same thing I do many times, I create its own bound method, which takes in uh, its current value. So in this case, for the height, width, red, green, blue, uh, adds the mutation to it, which could be positive or negative, and also says what boundaries it can't go above and below. Take a look at bound. Uh, this is just some simple enforcing a floor and ceiling. Um, so if, for example, height plus the mutated uh, mutated change is greater than this height maximum constant, then just return the maximum constant. Same for minimum. And if you're within both bounds, then just return back this value of the height plus mutation. Again, the same thing is true for width, red, green, and blue. So let's see what happens when I run this single inherit. Start here. Okay, I'm going to set my evolution style uh, to uh, aimless with single inheritance, but it doesn't have a goal. All right, so I'm going to set my seconds per generation. Yeah, 0.2 is fine. Mutation amount of 0.1, that's fine. Um, so as I step, you'll see everything changes just a little bit. It stays close to what it is, but changes. I go to run. Okay, it starts changing. Actually, I'm going to speed this up, setting that to 0.1. Okay, get things all moving here. Uh, maximize this to get a little bit of a better view. And you notice a couple of things happening, which kind of surprised me a little bit, is that everything turns grayscale. Uh, actually, you know, let me uh, restart this and just to, to demonstrate that a little bit more clearly. Set this at 0.05 and aimless. And let's uh, maximize on play and run. See, everything gradually turns to grayscale, whether white, black, or gray. And also, this takes a little bit longer, everything becomes square-shaped. So this one's still holding out, but it'll become square soon enough. And all these others, you know, they change their size, uh, but the width stays about the same as the height even though you know the scale will change and it things can change between white and gray and black but it stays grayscale and this i mean you've seen all of the code that's at play here now, there's no goal but they still have some kind of value that they move towards so that's where i am so far now one thing you may have noticed is that this single inherit method that we're using here. Uh, it only takes information from one parent. Um, you, know, you may be aware from genetics that, that the way pretty much all complex life works is it has two parents and it combines genes from both of them. And one of the things I want to explore in this project is why is that? You know, it's kind of simpler to just have a single parent pass the genes on directly. Um, but, you know, life has chosen to have a two-parent system, and there must be a reason for that. So this kind of thing, if I can, um, my next step is I'm going to, or one of my next steps is to build a way of combining um, the DNA from two different characters and, um, and spreading that out and see, see what changes in the result. And the other thing that's actually going to be before that is actually setting up some natural selection. Uh, right now, things kind of go towards grayscale squares, just, I'm guessing, because of entropy again, or, or something like that. Um, but there's no actual goal. There's no reward function here. And that's what I want to build in the next video. Until next time, uh, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe so you are notified when the next one comes out. And until then, I'm Will Patillo, signing out.